get us started by sharing my slides. So um, let me know if you have trouble seeing those. Um, I'm excited about this conversation because student belonging um, is such an important conversation in the scholarly conversation in the US, which is where I am from. I do speak German, so feel free uh, to ask your questions in German if that's a language that you feel comfortable, more comfortable speaking. Um, but today's talk will be um, in English. Um, and let's see, um, one of the big questions um, that I want us to think about um, today together is the role that universities can play in actively fostering student belonging on their campuses. Um, the focus of this conference is on the future and the digital future. And I, I really think that the notion of student belonging um, is going to be a major part of, um, of that conversation, particularly as we turn, we return back to our campuses from the pandemic and are looking for ways to cultivate um, community, but also think about what it means to be a heterogeneous society um, and what role universities can play um, in developing um, literacies in students um, around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so today, um, I wanted to just start by framing for you all just a little bit about who I am and um, what my background is and how I come to this um, particular topic. Um, I am a tenured associate professor for academic writing at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. It's Pitzer College is a highly selective um, liberal arts college. Um, and in Southern California in Los Angeles County. Um, but I started my, my academic, well, I guess I started life um, in a working class family. This is the picture that you see here on this page is of my mother who had me when she was um, 20 years old and I am the middle child. Um, and, um, and my mother um, worked for 30 years as a, um, as a, um, teaching assistant um, for special education children, um, but, I, um, but neither one of my parents um, went to college, had a university degree. Um, and so I was very interested in um, academic success. Um, as a young person, I saw that as an, a, a way of having more choices and being free of some of the financial and other kinds of social pressures on my family. Um, I started out at the Mills College um, at Northwest, at Northeast, it's now called um, Mills College at Northeastern University, which is in Oakland, California. It's a women's college. It was actually the first women's college to admit trans students and it has a curriculum focused on social justice. Um, from there, I decided I wanted to get a PhD and I entered a doctoral program at the University of Chicago, which was, uh, had an MA track embedded in it and completed my doctoral degree in comparative literature um, at the University of Chicago. But while I was there, I was exposed to their writing and rhetoric program, um, which is nationally renowned. Um, if any of you have read the book, The Craft of Research, which is, I think, the best guidebook on research-oriented writing for um, college students, you'll know about the University of Chicago's pedagogy. And I found it really transformative because I had grown up with this experience of the language being spoken at the university and especially in these elite universities like the University of Chicago, feeling really different than the language that was spoken at home. And the writing pedagogy gave me a language for that. Oh, this is what scholarly discourse looks like. So this is how you participate in intellectual discourse. It gave me the tools to do that. And I found that incredibly empowering. And that became, uh, it changed the trajectory of my career. Um, I moved to New York. Um, I taught writing at the New School and also at NYU, and then I had a postdoc at Princeton University for five years, where I was associate director, um, also of the writing program there. Um, and then from there, I went on to assume a professorship in academic writing um, at Pitzer College in California, which is known for its social justice orientation, where we really think a lot about community-engaged learning um, and student population is diverse. Um, and then um, um, I started at the European University of Vietnam as a research associate um, this summer, um, where I'm also thinking about these issues. And I'm really thinking about what it means to, um, um, yeah, to, to think about things like student belonging um, in, the, in a European context. And so I'm really excited about the opportunity to think with all of you about, um, yeah, about these issues um, and, and what translates and maybe what doesn't translate quite so well 
um, into the European context. Um, my, my lens, as you can hear, is sort of writing intensive teaching. I was also director of college writing at Pitzer College for nine years. So I have 12 years of experience being a director. So I have the administrator experience, but I also bring the perspective of, of a professor um, who teaches um, and have these dual lenses of speaking German fluently and engaging with the scholarly conversation in Germany around writing intensive pedagogies um, and also in the US. And I see myself as someone who builds bridges between those two scholarly conversations. Um, so I want to start my talk with a caveat that what I'm going to talk to you about today is really hard. <laughs> um, so you know, research from the scholarship of teaching and learning um, and the sociology of education have really emphasized the need to cultivate belonging on our campuses, um, particularly for first generation and minoritized students. Um, and the reasons for this are many relationship education, um, as 40 years of research have shown, um, correlate positively with student success. Um, and so, and we know from the literature that it's not enough to simply encourage students to take advantage of all that a university education has to offer. Um, we know that forms of belonging are granted by institutions and institutions have an active role in cultivating belonging. And I see this as what, um, <laughs> what my colleague um, Paul Hunstedt would call a wicked problem. This is a great book, Creating Wicked Students, is one that I really recommend, um, and that it can't easily be solved. It's something, um, there's no magic bullet for this. Um, and it's, um, so I'm not going to leave you today with um, easy fixes, but um, I'm hoping that what we'll do is, um, is Bring, I'll bring in some different lenses that get us sort of thinking about what it means to cultivate belonging on our campuses and what are some different areas that we can um, use to, or what are, what are some, what is a framework that we can use to guide our thinking and making our campuses more welcoming and belonging um, in, from an active institutional, in an institutional sense. Um, and this work is always ongoing. Uh, my colleague, Katrin Gergenzone, wrote a book called Fonda Innovacion to Institucion, where she talks about writing centers and how to institutionalize them. And she talks about this sort of institutional work of <laughs> student-led projects. So, you know, peer-led tutors and writing centers is the example that I'm most familiar with as, as, as being an ongoing process. So institutionalizing things like student belonging, thinking about how an institution can be agentive and not passive, just saying, hey, students, here we are, come and take advantage of us but can engage in more outreach and be more actively inclusive. This is really a wicked problem. That's something that we always need to be thinking about and working on and taking small and large steps to, um, to address. Um, so I want us to start with just kind of, um, as we enter this question of this field, um, to, you to just reflect for a moment from your own position, whether you're a faculty member or an administrator or student, or maybe you're a politician, like, what, how does your classroom or your center, um, or if you're a student, your student organization, help students feel like they belong? And if you could take just a minute and just jot down some key words um, in the chat, um, that, would be, that would be great. Um, and the goal here is to just stimulate some thinking about the topic before we, um, before we do more. And... I'm going to go ahead in the interest of time and spring ahead and introduce you to some sources that I find really helpful for thinking about university long, um, belonging. These are books that have all appeared within the last few years um, and um, have really made big waves in the higher education scene in the U.S. And they're books that a lot of faculty and administrators read when they're thinking about how to create welcoming and inclusive um, in uh, environments, and I'm just going to focus on the first two here, college belonging and relationship-rich education in the interest of time, but I wanted to flag these sources as really valuable if you want to um, uh, read more about these issues on your own time. So what I really wanna to say today um, is to get us to really think in a nuanced way about what does student belonging mean? Um, translated into German, uh, it's a buzzword in academic, discourse, but what does it really mean? And I wanted to introduce um, Lisa Nunn's research. She's a sociologist at the University of San Diego, um, my hometown, San Diego. Um, 
And um, she, she, she did an, a number of qualitative um, interviews with students and she published the results of her findings in this book, College Belonging. And she wanted to use students' own words to describe um, how they characterized what it meant to feel like they belonged to their institutions. Um, and she used her qualitative research to develop her theory and her theor theoretical model. So she describes it as feeling accepted for who you are and feeling valued by the larger community. And she says that these feelings in turn generate a kind of confidence that you have this liberty to let your guard down, to not feel like you always have to perform, right? To not feel self-conscious or, or worried about being judged. Um, and this um, feeling, she says, gives students the freedom to explore and thrive because they're unencumbered by doubt and insecurities. Um, so what does that mean and why should we care about it? Um, Nunn is arguing that if we really care about attracting and retaining students to our universities, this is definitely a concern in Brandenburg, I know, with the retention um, rates going down. Um, we want students, uh, we want to attract students to our universities, but we also want to keep them at our universities. And well-being is something that scholars of education um, have determined is really crucial to retention. Um, and so belonging is sort of at the, the intersection of um, recruiting students, having them be happy while they're here, like belonging is the glue that sort of holds those two pieces um, together. Um, and she says her, her main, one of her main arguments is that universities have a really limited sense of belonging, that they usually encourage students to take individual responsibility for their educations, you know, get out there, join clubs in German, the German context, this sense of Selbstwirksamkeit, you know, this sense of autonomy that's really valued in the educational system. And some sociologists of education are saying that doesn't align with how students actually um, feel welcome and included. Um, and, uh, excuse me, this slide did not upload so well, um, but um, evoking the sort of the classical sociologist um, Emil Durkheim, um, Nunn argues that belonging is something that communities provide individuals. It's not something that individuals can garner for themselves, right? So you, somebody has to extend membership to you in order for you to belong. You, you can't just kind of individually seek that for yourself. Like sociologists have been saying this for um, for over over a hundred years. Um, and she says, and the other thing that we seem, seem to be missing when we think about belonging um, is that we, it's more complex than we realize that there are there there are different modes of, of um, there are different ways to um, to belong. Um, there's the academic level, and that's really when you feel competent in your classes. Like, wow, you have what it takes to keep up with other people. Um, maybe you feel confident enough to raise your hand or or to talk with a professor one on one. You feel like you belong academically at the institution. There's also the social level, right? And this is about friendships, um, memberships in clubs or teams. You have the feeling that that your presence is important, and you would be missed if you if you suddenly didn't show up, right, to class or to um, an activity or to the the dorm, right? People know who you are, and um, and and they value your presence. And, and the last one uh, is campus community. So you kind of go up another tier. Um, and that's really feeling comfortable in your own skin as you walk around campus, really feeling like the amenities, the buildings, the events, the, you know, the, the curriculum, it's designed with you in mind, right? That, um, that you, you feel entitled also to take advantage of the resources that are, that are offered to you. Um, and yeah, so, and, and it's this last one that we, we often tend to overlook, this university-wide belonging. Um, and one thing that she says is, hey, belonging in one realm doesn't guarantee belonging in another. Um, and in the literature, um, we're really missing the importance um, of feeling like you belong to the wider campus beyond the smaller groups that you, um, that you belong to, right? You can, um, so, um, and this is something that her, her finding made clear. So one of the things I wanna leave you with, and this is in the content library, is this heuristic where you can think about in your own work and your own role at the university or in university politics, where are you most active in creating a climate of belonging? It's on the academic level, on the social level, in the campus community, do you see any gaps there? And I think 
Nunn's thesis and a thesis in a lot of other works is that we tend to pay a lot of attention now to the academic or more, or um, but we're also leaving out social and campus um, campus community. Um, so I guess um, this is kind of a question that I want to um, to leave you with: is what what more you can do to foster campus belonging, not just academic and social belonging, but those campus community belonging, even though those two things are, are, um, are really are really important. Um, the last theoretical framework I want to leave you with, because I think it's, um, it's useful before I open things up to um, Q&A, um, is this notion of, this is a really terrific book. Uh, and if you're looking for an engaging speaker at your event, um, um, these two scholars are really terrific at Elon University, which has been doing really a lot of the most I think interesting uh, scholarship around relationship rich education. And they basically say, hey, we don't pay attention to it, but what really makes our universities universities is the fact that they're relationship rich, right? Relationships matter on those campuses. So peer to peer relationships, student staff, student faculty relationships, they're really key to fostering learning, belonging, and success. Um, and they need to be created institutionally. Um, and um, the key is really about creating these environments is you need to ensure that students have lots of opportunities to connect with many peers, faculty, staff, and others on and off campus, right? Because they're going to develop different kinds of relationships and we need to be sure that we're curating a wide range of opportunities for students to engage. This I think is really interesting also as a heuristic um, um, that Felton and Lambert developed when they studied, they actually did a hundred interviews with different campuses across the US, um, a lot of qualitative research to inform this heuristic. And they found, huh, these campuses that are, that are really doing um, work that's leading to student success, they have cultures that value students, right? Students are seen holistically. They're invited to engage with sort of big questions of meaning and purpose um, in the curriculum, right? Um, and um, it's very student-centered kind of environment. Um, and that the, the faculty and staff are invested in relationship building. That seems to be part of the ethos of the campus. The, the campus values high quality teaching. Um, all of the research shows that the classroom is still the most high impact site for learning, even though learning happens in lots of different spaces on campuses. Um, and they value webs of human action uh, interaction. So there are lots of opportunities for connection and collaboration in the kind of curricular and co-curricular programming that takes place. And they tend to value engagement over prestige. And this <laughs> is a really interesting one for me as someone who's been at a, a number of elite universities in the US. Um, but if you, so, and I think that this is, um, if, if you're at a small college that really values growth over knowledge and prestige and being elite and so on, um, then this relationship university culture tends to come more easily um, to you and it, it tends to foster a more, a more welcoming um, environment for students. Um, and I come at this from the perspective of writing centers. I'm really interested in student engagement. So student peers are at the heart of the writing center at Pitzer College, where I was a director for nine years, and also at the Adrena, the writing center there, which actually was one of the first universities in Germany, one of two in 2007, to have peer tutors in writing centers, working with students on their writing one-on-one, -on -one, doing workshops around campus. Um, this kind, it's very relationship rich, right? So any kind of peer led kind of program or initiative where students are really working closely together with each other, they're building relationships with each other, they're learning leadership. Um, and, I, and I really think um, that we can think about what in our roles, how can we sort of reconfigure our roles or our centers or our programming um, to foster a sense of belonging with students so they have opportunities to interact with each other um, they learn how to interact better with faculty um, and, and also have meaningful interactions um, with staff. So in the context of Writing Center, that's a lot of professional development and mentoring. Um, so I think we're quickly arriving at the end, so I'm going to sort of scroll ahead um, and kind of maybe just leave you again with this slide of the, the heuristic um, and acknowledge maybe um, in the interest of time, I'll just maybe cut this down to one minute. One thing that I think has been really 
um, helpful, I'll let you look at this on your own, some things that you can do for building inclusive um, community that has come from a lot of research in the US um, that students are saying is helpful like in the classroom or in institutional spaces, knowing students' names, pronouncing them correctly, not mixing up students one for the other, um, maybe having students tell the story of their name as an icebreaker in class, um, as a community building event in a, in a center. Um, are students reflected in the curriculum? Uh, are you doing audits of your syllabi or of your departments to say, hey, are, in the staff training, are the things that we're reading or the ideas we're talking about, are they reflective of the range of students in the room so that people feel like this institution is made for them and it reflects them both in the curriculum um, and also in the co-curriculum. And one of the things that I'm in charge of is um, doing um, small teaching um, where I love this idea of small teaching. This is another really great book that I'll leave you with. Um, is um, it, it prioritizes small changes that you can make in your own teaching to make a difference. Um, and um, in, with the idea that these small incremental changes add up to something um, add up to something um, bigger. So I would, I'll leave you with that um, as, a, a, as a, a final tool. Um, and also just recognizing that faculty development is enough. We really, um, when we're thinking about institutionalizing um, belonging, it needs to come from the top, it needs to come from the middle, it needs to come from the bottom. There needs to be lots of thinking about what it means to cultivate um, belonging in an uh, academic spaces. So I think um, in the interest of time, I went, through my last slides kind of quickly there, but I'll leave, I'll pause on this, this last slide so that you can um, maybe sit with it for a bit because I think it's, it's uh, really useful and we'll open things um, up to questions. I'm really excited for your feedback and um, your thoughts or reactions. Let me, let me jump in here. Um, we got some great comments uh, and different questions. One of them was, for instance, uh, on someone saying, uh, if we have a free university and a free education system, but mm -hmm. we belong proprietary, uh, or we use proprietary or private software, this influences mm -hmm. my sense of belonging. This is a comment from um, Jane Moreau. Do you mm -hmm. think, can you say something about this? Like the tools we use and, uh, how we might um, consider this issue as it does um, as it might influence the, the, the feeling of belonging. How do you do this? Yeah, no, I think that that's a really great question um, because um, that, might, that might not be even something that, that administrators are aware of, right? That, that, that public universities have a, have, that they, they're supposed to contribute to the common good, right? Um, and when we when we use these commercial softwares, what does that communicate about our ethos and about our our, our, our role in society and our values, right? And so, um, so I that's a really I wasn't expecting to get that question, but I find it really powerful um, because I think one of the, wouldn't it be so interesting if um, and this is a recommendation, a version of a recommendation from the University of Southern California Center for um, for race and equity, which is really the center for research on inclusiveness in the U.S., they've got a data set now of over two million <laughs> responses. Oh. So, and, they, and they've done lots of qualitative research for many years, and recently started doing quantitative. And they said that they've just started to do focus groups on campuses with one question: like, what, what is it, what, what would it mean for the institution to make it you feel like you belong here? Hmm. Right, and, and just that's such a simple but such a rich question. And I think it can capture things like the tools we use, we think that they're neutral, um, but they're communicating something about, about, yeah, about our values. Yeah, yeah. There was also a question or a comment from uh, Cynthia Heiner, uh, and she mentioned uh, there's not much of a university community slash identity that includes both students and faculty to connect in social ways. Mm -hmm. you have maybe examples of, of this, or is this something uh, you've looked into or found research mm -hmm. about um, that would promote this kind of social connection? Yeah, so I, I, if you're looking for ideas, I really recommend that book, Relationship Rich Education, because um, 
It gives so many examples of different ways that faculty and students can connect. So one way that faculty and students can connect is through research, right? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, what is the department doing to orient students to the life of the universities? Are there social events, right? I think that that's a really great thing. Maybe the university is so focused on the academic um, that um, that they haven't they haven't focused on. Oh, are we, are we doing social things so that students get to know us as people? I was really surprised in my. This is actually shown the research, um, and, and none actually has a different book that talks about this as well. Um, the power of self disclosure. Like I tell students how I became a professor, right? And and those kinds of that social sharing is a way of inviting somebody into the institution. And, and there are lots of things that we learn through that process too, right? You learn about somebody's um, kind of invisible, <laughs> the sort of invisible person uh, or personal needs or experiences that led someone to make certain choices. And there's a lot of informal mentoring that can happen in those spaces. So I think just asking the question is a good place to start and sort of figuring out what would work on your campus. Um, mm -hmm to bring folks together, but I absolutely, I'm really excited about this new movement in Germany to think about students as active participants. Um, you all have been responsible for all of the wonderful progressive changes in the curriculum, many of them in the US, and, um, and I think that's on the horizon in Germany as well. That's great. So this is also a great example that you gave of like relationship, te relationship rich teaching, which mm -hmm. one of the other questions was about. Um, let me see if there's any new questions coming in. Please pop them in the chat. Meanwhile, from my side, I'd, I'd be interested. Like, do you have uh, anything to say about um, like virtual students uh, as part of a campus belonging feeling? Of course, they're online, but maybe this could be interesting to still mention something about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think um, I think. You know, being being in person and being embodied, it is. Uh, there are different. Uh, I don't have the I don't have the article at my fingertips, but I think there's uh, emerging research is showing ah, uh, there's there's something about in person that you can't fully replicate online. But I think that there's also a lot of prejudice about online teaching, and the literature on good online pedagogy really focuses on you got to motivate students that's the number one thing how do you motivate students right mm -hmm. um and that's interactions there's a lot of research that shows the number of interactions that faculty have with students in online forms and that you facilitate for students to have with each other um that has an impact on motivation right and it makes students feel seen and and um, and, and building community, like I, I really feel like a lot of the research in the US on digital pedagogies, I love that book on small teaching. There's a version of it, small teaching online, and it's it's the best thing out there on digital pedagogies. I've read a lot of them and they're drier. Like if you're gonna read one book, like read that one in English, it's so good. I mean, a big part of it focuses on how do you build community in the classroom, right? And, and there are lots of ways that you can do that with icebreakers, um, with forms, responding, finding a way to name each student in the classroom, right? Having students work in, there are different ways of doing it. Can you break them into small groups and they work together in small groups online? Or do you yeah. want to mix them up? There's there's a lot that one can do to build community. Could, could you repeat again that, that book title, uh, Beatrice asks? It was small teaching uh, in, in digital spaces? And um, it's called teaching. Small Teaching Online. And which it's by um, Darby Flower and James Lang. So James Lang wrote this bestseller, Small Teaching, which I think is really great. And Small Teaching Online is a version for digital spaces. And it came out in 2019. And then the pandemic hit. And it like for a short period, like you couldn't get your hands on it. But it, yeah. it literally was the thing that um, my faculty colleagues who don't like to read things on pedagogy, they read this book and liked it. Like it's it's like it's it's that kind of um, <laughs> that kind of work. I found the link in the meanwhile, and I, I put it in the chat here for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. um, so with an eye on the time, we are 10 seconds uh, left. Uh, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of the whole team and on behalf of all the, the participants here for, for your talk. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. It was delightful to be here. Great.